Uh, thank you very much. So a uh, few disclaimers. First, this has little to do with the brain. It's not an attempt to do anything that is ne neuro neurologically uh, plausible. The second one is this is work that we did a few years ago, and it's extremely mathematical. So I'll, of course, give intuitions, but but uh, I may or may not try to go in the math, and um, it's going to be hard for everybody, me included, because it's we haven't I. We haven't looked at this for a few a few years. The, the The story of this is I was discussing with Irina, and in no way had I ever thought of applying this to um, a neural network because we thought about this in very different contexts. But then, you know, talking to Irina, it seemed like yes, actually, this is relevant. And thinking slightly more, I do believe this is relevant. So my goal here is to you know spread ideas out. There are lots of uh, uh, people with very agile brains in the audience, and hopefully some things will happen. And another disclaimer, actually the person who has really been leading this line of research is not me, it's Julien Meral. And uh, we, with a, a very um, brilliant student, Arthur Mensch, we contributed something that I think is extremely important, but we contributed something building upon a historical line of research by Julien Meral, he had the Test of Time Award uh, at ICML for his 29-2010 paper. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about, you know, very general things about gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent, and then I'll talk a lot about majority minor uh, um, uh, algorithms, and they're the same class of algorithm that alternating uh, a minimization, and I'll, I'll explain why. So let, let's start with gradient descent. This is a picture of, uh, of gradient descent. Uh, really, you know, gradient descent, we're minimizing, we're trying to optimize on W to minimize some form of cost function, and uh, we're just iterating by, uh, you know, modifying W with something that is proportional to the gradient of the lost uh, uh, on W. This works well, uh, but if we're not well conditioned, then the problem is the gradient is not pointing in the direction of the minimum, even in the case of a simple quadratic function. And then things uh, start going bad and you get these kind of oscillating behaviors or you need to decrease the uh, step size a lot and then you get very, very slow convergence. Uh, and really the reason is because if you look at the local gradient, uh, I can use pointers or I can move around. Uh, if you look at, well, they're both as bad, using pointers and moving around. If you look at the local gradient, right, it's not in the direction of the minimum. And so you're just oscillating. And the solution is well known. You do something that is second order. So basically, you look at the curvature. And with the curvature, you can correct your, your, your gradient. This uh, works extremely well if you're in uh, batch settings. And there are all kind of uh, very good ways of approximating the, the Hessian. Uh, in online settings, it's a much, much, much more difficult problem. As far as I'm concerned, it's not solved. At least it's not solved in a very robust way. And you should ask people like Nicolas Leroux. But, uh, but momentum gives you a right. solution. Exactly. Momentum gives you a lot of solution. This trivial problem would be solved by momentum. I'm just, I'm just giving the intuition, right? I'm, I'm not claiming to do a state-of-the-art on gradient descent. Uh, but this, uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is an important problem. Uh, stochastic gradient descent, uh, the idea is uh, your uh, uh, cost function is the sum of many uh, identical uh, uh, cost functions. So you can think of it as the expectation uh, uh, on a random distribution uh, of uh, uh, an individual cost function. And then if you rewrite the gradient descent uh, in terms of expectation, then the idea being that uh, you are going to use a cheap estimate of this expectation. Now we'll call this our first butchering. Uh, you're basically, if you subsample uh, uh, the sum, uh, you get an unbiased uh, uh, estimate with more variance, and this variance will be a problem. But uh, uh, then uh, uh, you can still still get convergence. And something that's crucial is that uh, you need to decrease uh, the, the step sizes in a certain way. So. Other disclaimer, I'll be talking about optimization, so minimizing functions. I will not be talking about generalization, and there might be differences. You, especially with complicated objects like neural nets, you might not want, you, you, you want to be careful about how you optimize. 
This is not what I'll be talking about today. Okay? Uh, so this is great in the sense people have pushed this much, much further, and this is the workhorse of deep learning these days. Uh, so it, you know, has challenges. Well-known one is um, uh, vanishing gradients. Uh, so in, in recursive neural networks, but also in very deep networks, the idea being that, you know, you're, you're propagating the information across many, 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 many layers, and if those layers are not well-conditioned, then they just, information just vanishes. This is a conditioning problem, right? It means that if you have a very, very deep net, the uh, uh, modification that you need to do at the uh, uh, bottom of your deep net, at the, at the weights of your, your entrance layer, uh, uh, may have a very different scale than the one that you need to do at the output to have the same delta on the output, okay? So extremely different scalings. Extremely different scalings means conditioning problems. Extremely different scaling is what we have here. We have two variables that have very different scalings, okay? So this is a conditioning problem. People have looked at it uh, as a conditioning problem and have contributed very uh, interesting stuff that I will not talk about. Another um, advance that I claim is related is batch norm. Uh, I like the view that, that batch norm somewhat controls conditioning, and there has been some conceptual results that show this. And the way I like to think about it is I like to think about a deep linear network. A deep linear network is something I understand better than a deep nonlinear network. So basically, I've got a product of many matrices. And the problem is that those matrices, I'll get the same exact output if one goes very big and the other one goes very small. Okay, so I've got this, this instability, and this instability, if it happens, will create a bad conditioning. So if, you know, one layer has become huge and another layer has become tiny, it means I don't have the same natural scale on both layers. So I have a conditioning problem. And batch norm somewhat addresses this. All right. So that's all for stochastic gradient descent. Now I want to move to something different which is major minorant uh, class of algorithms that are pretty much the same thing as alternated optimization, and I'll explain why. And I'll immediately uh, uh, say that uh, uh, the Meral 2013 paper uh, really proves uh, uh, the uh, convergence of those class of algorithms in stochastic settings. Unfortunately, it's an extremely technical paper, and so it's not read a lot. I mean, it's really hard to read. Uh, but the core results are there, uh, though the, the delta that we made with the 2017 publication is important. And most of my talk will be focused on matrix factorization. The actual reason is because this is what we were interested in when we did this. On the other hand, matrix factorization may or may not be an interesting toy problem to look at for deep learning. So, you know, we have one matrix Y and we're trying to decompose it in a product of two matrices. Another thing I should say is that this is very deep links to online EM algorithms, which I will not talk about. And we're, ta we're taking a different approach to them is we're, we're not computing expectations, we're just me computing majorant and minimums. I would like to believe that one of the benefits is that we're not con we're not as conditional to data distributions, and but there are drawbacks. So uh, matrix factorization, uh, the class of problems we were looking at is written as such. So we have a cost function uh, and, a, and a penalty, and the cost function here. I'm taking the simplest one. We can work with more complicated one, but I'm taking the simplest one. Uh, this can't be solved by stochastic gradient descent. I just, you know, I'm optimizing on E and S. I just take a weight vector uh, uh, W that is the concatenation of the vectors of E and S. I can compute the gradient, and I can solve this with stochastic optimization. This is typically done uh, for recommender systems where you're doing matrix factorization. People are often using stochastic gradient descent. We approach this in another setting. We approach this in the setting of brain imaging. So the setting we're interested in, historically, uh, was with huge matrices, and one of the challenges was that they were huge both ways. Uh, and the, the naive way of tackling this is alternated minimization. I will first minimize, I will, you know, so block coordinate descent. Uh, 
all this is the same thing. So I will uh, I will minimize with respect to e keeping s constant, and then minimize with respect to s keeping e constant, and I'll alternate. And this hopefully will converge because each time I'm decreasing the cost. Okay. Now this is a terrible strategy because it's a batch strategy. You need to go over your data all the time. So if you have somewhat large data, it's incredibly slow. <clears throat> so what Junior Miral did in 2010 is that he rewrote this problem as an expectation, basically uh, uh, writing the Frobness norm as the sum of individual norm on each sample, okay, because the Frobness norm is separable, and then said, well, this sum is something I can consider as an expectation. So I have an expectation of a subproblem, and then I will optimize, I will use stochastic optimization on this, and I will optimize on subsamples. However, the detail is the, 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 this algorithm is not a stochastic gradient descent. And I'll go, I'll go into this because it, it matters a lot. So uh, if you do this, then you can tackle a, a matrix factorization in an online way where you're streaming the data and you're each time optimizing part of the problem. So you need to optimize fully one of the two matrices and partly another. Fully one of the two matrices, partly another. And the matrix that you need to fully optimize is the matrix that, so you've got two matrices, so they, they're sometimes called loading and, and dictionary. I mean, there are different vocabularies, but one of the matrix is, is, is sample-wise, you know, you have one, one value of the matrix per sample, and the other is not, okay? It's the latent factor, basically. So what you're gonna do is that you're gonna give up on optimizing well the sample-wise matrix, but you're going to optimize well the latent factor, okay? That is the core trick. And at the end of the day, you know, there's no free lunch. You don't have the sample-wise matrix, but you have the latent factor, okay? <laughs> so this works well. I mean, you go from something that is intractable to something that is very tractable. And on, on, uh, on uh, a brain data, it works. That's not the point here. So what we did, uh, this was too slow for us because our matrix was huge in both directions. And so what we did was that we also subsampled in the other direction. So basically each observation was made of a huge number of um, uh, features because it was brain data and it was like a million dimensional uh, data. And so what we did was we subsampled in this direction. By the way, I already presented this in Mila a couple years ago, but hopefully the audience is a bit different. Uh, so what we did is we subsampled the rows. And by doing this, we're quote unquote butchering our cost function. We're getting approximation of our cost function. And, and the thing is we can show it still works. And, and I'll go over this, but if we show it still works, we can also know how to like have a good algorithm that uh, uh, converges extremely fast. So we get 10 times speed up. Uh, uh, with no, like, implementation tricks. This is all Python code. Probably, I'll tell you later, right? but probably, but I'm not absolutely certain. You would have to, you would have to add I mean, I'll go in the in the algorithm, but basically, you've got you've got two steps. You would probably need to add a projection step uh, on the orthogonal matrices, and this will add cost. And yeah, 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 yeah. That would be in the BCD step. Okay, so ten times speed up. Uh, that's great. We're happy. And uh, 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 so empirically, uh, we compared this to uh, stochastic gradient descent. And so there are two things there. One is it did go much faster than stochastic gradient descent on a variety of problems. Uh, and, and the second thing is that the we don't have really to set a learning rate, and I'll go back to this detail. 
But what I'm showing you here is the best convergence grid searching for the learning rate of SGD. This is a bit annoying in practice because you have this hyperparameter that is hard to, 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 to set. So this is one example on brain data that, and oh, the, when I'm showing those curves, I'm showing the cost function on new data because we're doing stochastic optimization. So uh, what we're really interested in is optimizing the expectancy of the cost function. So the way we validate this is by showing new data, okay? Uh, so this is applied to a variety of different problems with different constraints and different penalties uh, and different kind of data. You've got brain data, uh, you have um, hyperspectral imaging, uh, uh, satellite data, and what you can see is that often but not always we're vastly uh, uh, faster than stochastic gradient descent. And uh, not always, you can see here that it's not the case. This data, by the way, is smaller, as you can see that, uh, uh, for instance, this, this data, okay? This is on recommender systems, so different kind of data. It's sparse, it's not dense. Uh, and uh, what we can see, by the way, I, I forgot to say, this is uh, time, this is not epoch. And the reason it's time and not epoch is what we're really doing is that we're really doing many steps that are much faster but have more variance. Okay, we're once once again we're butchering our cost function. I'll come back to this. And so this allows us to do many steps. And the question is not you know in terms of how much data we said uh, we've seen. If if we're trying to optimize how much data we're seeing, then we shouldn't be doing this. We're trying to optimize time. We're trying to go faster. And okay, so what you're seeing here is that the bigger the data set, the more the gain. And the reason is is quite common in stochastic optimization. The bigger the data set, the more likely you, you are to have redundancy in the data. And this only works because we have redundancy in the data, because we're subsampling very large sums. And by subsampling very large sums, we're getting unbiased estimates with a larger variance. Okay? So Technically, the way uh, uh, the original Meral algorithm works is the following, and I apologize, I have different notations than before. Sorry, I, I, I was quite sick this week and didn't have much time to work on that presentation. Uh, so, we're going, so we're streaming, yes. Yeah. From a VAE. Yeah, I mean, sure, same thing. VAE, VAE is, I mean, all these things are latent factor models. Well, okay, no, let's say autoencoder, because variational, then, then I claim there is a bit of a difference. Do you fit autoencoders using batch uh, algorithms? You can, but do you do it? It's, it's very slow. Because if you need if each step of your gradient, you need to look at your whole data. If your data is big, it's going to take forever to converge. Yes. Yeah, difference between batch and mini batch. Sorry, what I call batch, maybe we have, we have a vocabulary problem. What I call batch is I look at the full data. What I call mini batch is I look at a, a subset of the data. <laughs> no, that's a valid question. Why do I want the, these complicated? That's a very valid question. And and I mean, there's there's so yeah. Let's go. So it's basically for me, it's the whole point of the workshop here is we can say SGD works. It's true. Experience has shown that at least for dictionary learning, these things work massively better for several reasons. One of them is you don't need to 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 set a learning rate. The other one, and I'll come back to it, is it's got a better memory, and that's actually related, by the way. The fact that you don't need to set the learning rate in the better memory. Uh, and what we're going to show later is that we can butcher the way we do our updates. If we control a bit what we do, we can still converge. And this is really what we're showing here. So with these things, we're really doing very approximate updates. And the reason we're doing very approximate updates is that 
we're looking only at a subset of the features. You give me a, a, a data that has a million features. I'm going to look at 100,000, which is a lot, but is a subset. And I will update my weights only based on this. So in no way have I computed a proper error term, whether it's with gradients or with other things. And, and as I'll, I'll discuss, the, the thing about this class of algorithm is that it can be robust to this. So this is why we're getting speed ups. This is a good example. The reason we're getting speed ups is that, well, one reason, there are two reasons, and I'll come back to this. But one of them is that we can be robust to pretty brutal approximations and still converge. So we can see more data at a time. <clears throat> Completely agree, and this is why back when we did this, we thought this is a cute idea, it can work on a, b a bunch of problems, which are basically matrix factorizations with a variety of losses. So on Gamma Poisson, it also works, but it's not a general thing. However, you know, talking to Irina, I'm starting to think it's all down to, and, and I'll go a bit more in the detail, but it's all down to can we, basically, can we get some good approximation of the loss? If we have a lot of structure, it's easy. If we don't have a lot of structure, it requires more thinking. And to me, this is a completely open question. But... I'll, I'll present fairly theoretical results that tell us that if we get a decent approximation of the loss, and the decent doesn't have to be very good, then we can converge. And the real question is going to be, can we get these decent approximation of the loss in a way that right. saves a lot of compute time? Because if we can, we won. If we can't, we lost. I'm not, I'm not claiming this is useful for neural nets. I'm claiming we should look at it, which is a different thing. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, it's linear. There's no nonlinearity in here. Right, right. But there's no in terms of in terms of the forward pass. There's no nonlinearity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, we need. We need. We yes, we need. We need the, the problem to be decomposable to apply this exact uh, 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 trick. But the reasons that I'll show are much, much, much uh, uh, broader than this. Okay? So basically, if the loss is decomposable, so if, we, it, if it's a sum on, on, if it's a double sum, then we can immediately benefit from this. But the theoretical results that we have are much broader than this. Of course, now the challenge is going to be, can we instantiate them in a, in a good setting? So yeah, so the, the, I mean the way the way this this the way the Meral, the original Meral uh, uh, algorithm works and it's it's useful to to understand it a bit is that we're going to optimize a subproblem and the subproblem here is computing the uh, um, the loading of the dictionary on a batch of data or in a single instance so on a mini batch or a single instance I should be careful with my terms and this. Here it appears like this, and it could appear differently if I had a different loss, okay? And then we're updating what I will call the surrogate function, and this is where it's, it's important. So this resembles the loss I'm trying to optimize. It resembles the, uh, 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 the uh, from this norm, but that is super important. It is not because it would be if I had the optimum alpha, the one that I have at convergence one, but I don't have it. So what I'm doing is I'm using suboptimal alphas. And I'm just using the sum over the path of my algorithm of suboptimal alphas. Because these alphas are suboptimal, this cost is above my true, my, the, the thing I'm really trying to optimize, okay? 
that is that is the crucial part. So because I have suboptimal latent factor, I have a cost that is above. So I will call this my surrogate cost, and this is really the big difference with gradient distance, is we're, we're optimizing surrogate costs, and we're explicit about this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it is, it is. It's... And, and then there's, there's a trick, and Irina is same, same formulation, and then there's a trick. At... <laughs> and, and this trick is crucial, and this is where we might break, is that this cost here is uh, it's, it's a simple from this norm, so it's easy to expand uh, with, you just expand it, and there's a trace that appears. But most importantly, this is only, this is fully characterized by two things, the covariance of the dictionary and the projection of the dictionary on the data. So two things. And with this, if I know this, I fully know my cost. So this is a specific case. This is a really easy case, right? So it's linear, it's two norm. You need for, it comes from, and I'll come back to this, it comes from if you want to provably converge to the optimum, you need a variance reduction mechanism. This is it is your memory. You discounting yeah. sample. Exactly. And you, don't and you, you need this for a variance reduction, because if you don't need this, it's like stochastic gradient without decreasing the learning rate. You will get to a certain point of the optimum, but then you'll go around, which may or may not be a problem for neural nets. But if you're really trying to get the optimum, then you need this. I think well, and, and, and that's where the proofs are interesting, is that by going on the proof, we improve that. And so the thing is, so that's crucial. So these two, two things are the covariance of the dictionary and the projection of the dictionary on the data. If we know them, we fully can characterize our loss. And so this is a big difference with stochastic gradient descent is because we know our loss, we basically are gathering sufficient statistics of the loss on accumulated on the data. Now that's also the drawback. This is not something as, not a toolbox as convenient to instantiate a stochastic gradient descent. I need to know more. I need to know what are the sufficient statistics of my loss. I, well, if I want to have it provably converge. Now, there's a difference. I'll be talking about, you know, theoretical results on conversions. Sometimes we can get over them and still have things that work even if we don't have proofs, right? Oh, the fact that you discount it is, is how you get your variance reduction. If you don't do this, you will converge to variance level. So why is this important? This is, this is crucial, actually. This is the big difference with gradient descent. We, so the picture you need to have in mind is that of a, a stochastic major minor. So we're basically, we're taking our complicated loss function and we're going to approximate it with something. What we're approximating it with here, that's, it's a simple case, right? Is this quadratic function where we are using, so this one, where we're using something that has stored the memory. The big deal is that this is second order because here we have the covariance of the data. So the big deal is that this is robust to ill conditioning. Now, this will work only if you can write those sufficient statistics. No free lunch. Okay. And once we have this, we minimize the surrogates and anything works, right? We can use gradient descent, we can use block coordinate descent, we can use closed form, if we have closed form, anything works, okay? <clears throat> so, so this is, this is the original 2010 paper. 
And then Julien proved it, that it's more general, that it works in, in his 2013 paper. He, he proved that it works for uh, uh, a, not only for squared loss and everything, but it's nice to understand it for squared loss. Sure. No, the problem with momentum is it's completely it's it's completely blind to uh, uh, to the to the actual full Hessian. Okay, the momentum. I was trained as a physicist. Momentum is like is like putting friction in an oscillator, right? It will avoid the oscillation, but it's not rescaling the different directions. This is much closer because uh, the matrix A is the converges to the covariance of your variables. So, so it is very different. This is technically, it's not a great in this sense. So I can't say it's a second order algorithm, but it's closer to a second order algorithm. And the only way it can work is because we're capturing this covariance. Right? Okay, so what we did, now, now I'm gonna go back, so this is the original paper. Now I'm gonna go back to what we did. And what we did was that we uh, 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 we used the fact that our loss was decomposable to uh, uh, basically approximate our loss even further. And so our loss was a sum over samples, but a sum also over features. We sub the 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 work by Julien shows that you can subsample the sum over samples. We showed that you can also subsample the sum over features. Okay, so we're basically looking at different features that each we're sampling features each time. Now the code becomes horrible, and I won't go into the details, but there's different things. So this is a formalism that you need to put forward to be able to study the algorithm. The Some important things are in green, and there are gain variance reduction. So these things are necessary to not completely forget the past, and the fact that you're, you we're subsampling features, but we're, you know, we're going to see features again every once in a while. And so basically we want to average what we've seen back then uh, and what we now see. So we're going to be updating those, uh, uh, those covariances and projections, but with some averaging factor. No, it's not in the ICML paper. The ICML paper did not converge because it did not have this. It converges. It converges to epsilon, but after uh, epsilon, it, it it We didn't we didn't know it when we submitted. You know what? That will be the memory for continuous learning, but it's all raging and probably doesn't work. And so, yes, and there's a fundamental thing is when I, I presented this to Google Brain, uh, I don't remember who, but somebody doing a, a RL at Google, Google, Google Brain told me yeah, basically it's the same kind of stuff you have in RL. And I, Dona is in the room and I don't know anything about RL, uh, so I can't tell. But basically he told me, oh, yeah, yeah, the equations are very similar. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's not, but we're using in the proofs, and those proofs are horrible, and, and Arthur Mensch uh, and Julien Meyer did them. But in the proofs, we're using techniques, the Martingale techniques, uh, uh, that are quite common in RL, apparently. Because you need, you need to take into account your past. I'll, I won't go too much in the details, partly because I can't. But anyhow, those, the only thing I want to point out is that those green factors are important because they, they take into account the past, and taking into account the past is what makes us better than gradient descent. It's, I, I believe so. Because that's what gives you problem. Exactly, what, what gives me a good surrogate function. Yeah. Okay, and so, by the way, this is the difference to the uh, ICML paper, is that if we don't do the average estimators, we don't convert, as you can see. So this averaging is useful, but only to converge to very tight precision. This is published. This is a twenty. It's it's the twenty. Uh, uh, it's it's a twenty eighteen paper in transaction and signal processing. 
it, it, it's published. Yeah. I had to go back to the paper to do those slides. Yeah, but it didn't have this. The ICML paper had, I'm, I'm getting lost in my slide. The ICML paper had this, but not this. The difference is minor, but sometimes it matters. Uh, I don't know. Who cares about trading? No, I, I don't know. We haven't looked. And, and uh, this, is in, this is not, so well, the reason why we're not looking is two things. We're optimizing an expectancy. When we're optimizing the expectancy, the, the, the proper way of validating optimizing expectancies. So, okay, the, we, we, it's a latent factor model. We're only optimizing the latent factors. We're not optimizing the, the loadings. Uh, if any, the, any kind of controls that we have is on the expectancy of the optimality of those latent factors. The way you compute an expectancy that is unbiased is you draw new data. You can't use the data that, that you've used to optimize. So any kind of theoretical results that you will have are, are an expectancy. And in practice, to test them, you need to, to, to do new data. That's fairly classic. 15 minutes, thank you. <coughs> OK, so once again, why does it work? It works because we're having a majority of the cost function every time. And this is a very useful ID to have in mind. And, I, and, and my, my real question is, can we repurpose it for other architectures, like deep ones, for instance? And then the question is, you know, what kind of majority do we want? And then it's quite open. There are many ways. And so Irina did one kind of majority, but maybe we can do others. This is the real question. And this was all proved uh, in the Mehal 2013 paper. So really, the, the Mehal 2013 paper tells us that at each step, we're doing a surrogate, and I've written here it quadratic because quadratic is easy, but it could be something else. And then we're minimizing the surrogate. Surrogate, minimizing the surrogate. Now, what we did in the 2017 or 2018 paper, I don't remember, is that we said it's okay. A surrogate doesn't have to be exact. It can be approximate. Our optimization doesn't have to be exact. It can be approximate. And by the way, this actually completes the proof of the Mehal paper because what Julien had seen in his implementation is that he didn't need to do several iterations of block coordinate descent. So basically, he did not need to do a full optimization. The whole paper. Because in practice, he actually never did. No, nobody does it. And the thing is, we can prove it works. So back to my point is, and I'll, I'll discuss this a bit more in detail, but what we're showing is that you can butcher a lot of things. You can butcher your approximation of the cost function. And this is what we should be trying to use in, in deep learning. So, you know, we're propagating information. Can we propagate less information? Yeah. Can we propagate information with delays? I don't know. Uh, this is an idea that came a few weeks ago talking to Irina. I never thought about this in the context of deep learning. And the other one is we don't need to have good optimization. I'll put like numbers on this, well, proofs on this later. But really the important thing is we don't need to have a good approximation. We don't need to have a good minimization. Yes, and this is what I'll talk about. Uh, this is what I'll mention. Yeah, yeah. And good enough is decreasing, basically. These two need to be decreasing, and we'll put math on it, and then the math becomes horrible. But basically, they need to be decreasing. This is why. So if you want to prove that you converge, and by the way, you might not need to prove that you converge if you're doing uh, uh, deep learning, because sometimes it's not good to optimize these things extremely well. But if you want to prove that you converge, uh, uh, you need uh, this thing to be decreasing, the, the approximation to be decreasing, and the, and the partial minimization to keep, keep getting closer. This is easy. This is hard. This is where we need variance reduction. We need memory. Because if we don't have memory, well, we're not going to get it cheaply. The problem is this GD is catastrophic for gauging, basically because it doesn't have any form of memory whatsoever. Intuition is yes. Yeah, but how to proofs how to uh, is going to be a nightmare. I don't care about proofs, sorry. Uh, but would it work? I think yes, because you have a memory term. And then your, your challenge is going to be to tune this memory term with how fast your distribution changes. 
Yeah. That's a good point, and in, I, I think the answer is both, uh, but I'm not sure. Okay, no, the problem is you've got two surrogates. That's why. You have, you have, yes, yes, okay. You have two surrogates, oh God. You have uh, the surrogate at a given point, and you have the surrogate with memory. So the fact, so you need to consider that you've optimized this thing plus all the rest in the past. This is a surrogate at the, as it's written here. This is a surrogate at the current point. This is a surrogate with the memory. So very good question. One of them. Yes, exactly. And because you have, and because all the others were, were majorants, the fact that you've always had majorants means that when you sum over the path, you still have majorants. A sum of majorants is a majority. <clears throat> God, am I get, I'm really hesitating to go, to go in these things. So really, the, so the idea being that you've got two steps, one which is a majorization test, a, a step which computes an approximate surrogate of the loss function, that's kind of the answer to your question actually, of the loss function close to your previous weight, and sorry, W has become theta here, uh, and so, and it's an, so this surrogate function is approximate because it is close to a true upper bounding surrogate. Okay? That's the first thing. So it's approximate uh, 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 surrogacy. And the second thing is, is quite simple, is you take an approximate minimum. So you can take any any minimum algorithm, uh, a minimizing uh, uh, algorithm that you want, you know, block coordinate descent, gradient descent, anything, and you can already stop it, which is nice. Okay, I, I basically I went through the paper and I looked at the assumptions. And here we have assumptions on the loss function, but honestly, they're not interesting because they're quite classic assumptions. There are things like, things are reasonably well bounded. Uh, they don't need to be con uh, convex, by the way. They're reasonably well Lipschitz. So basically they're well behaved, but not convex. And, and there exists some form of derivative. This gets back to my original question. Does definitely depend on the loss function. No, but this is easy. The rest is hard. This is easy. Sure, yes. Um, one thing I wonder about with this, though, is there thing uh, uh, I'm now I'm getting his first name, uh, that basically in larger networks, you end up getting better smoothness in your loss function. So I wonder if this would actually scale better on larger problems. Have you guys explored that? We've explored nothing. I mean, this we, we did we did this prediction and learning and then trashed it because our problem was solved. We had a specific problem, it was solved, trashed it, talking in the kitchen to Irina three weeks ago is like darn those results are useful. But in no way did we try this on your lens. Because like if you've got proofs that Uh, well, I would I would expect it it would, and the reason is, uh, but it's it's even more than this. Is the, the 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 those very large networks they have redundancy in the weights, and so I we could do things. This is why the ideas, but we could do things like update a subset of the weights, but a different subset each time, right? Because you want your updates to be unbiased, uh, and. The bigger your network, I suspect, the more beneficial this is because you've got more and more redundancy. So intuitively, yes, but this is the easy thing. The next step is the hard one. All right. So what do we have? So that's the that's the stochastic mm. So that's the old thing, not the approximate mm. 
And what it really needs in terms of concept is the idea of first order surrogate function, where the idea of first order surrogate function is a function that is well behaved and matches what we're trying to optimize. Fine. And with this and the prior stuff, things converge. So stochastic MM. But we, we, we don't yet have an approximate uh, uh, majority. That's the hard thing. Okay, so this is the algorithm. It's pretty natural. You draw data, you compute a, 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 a surrogate function, which is a majority of your cost function, but that's close enough. You optimize it, and you draw more data. Okay, now let's get to the approximate MM. This is, this is really the interesting thing. This is nice, but if you need to fully optimize everything each time, it's going to be terribly costly. It's like online alternated optimization. What we have here is online alternated optimization where you don't really optimize well. And this is interesting. So then we need the notion of approximate first order surrogate. And oh God, those things are horrible. Uh, the idea being that the error between what you're trying to approximate, what you're, what you're trying to surrogate and your approximate surrogate is bounded. Was that? My slide is that it goes down was And then you need another thing, which is uh, crucial, and that's the hard thing, and that's is the, where the memory comes in, is that you need the error between your approximate surrogate and your surrogate to vanish. So the, 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 it's, it's a bit technical, but the important thing is that the expectancy of the error, so technically there are all expectancy results, so it means you can have noise. It doesn't need to, like, you don't need to always have a good circuit. You can have a bad circuit every once in a while. So you need the expectancy of the error to, to decrease fast enough. Okay? And that's the hard thing. This is where you need memory. You need these things. If you don't have this, you won't converge, which may not be a big deal because sometimes you're not really interested in optimizing things very well. Okay? So you need this. Thank you. And then, uh, God, what does this say? Yes, you need, you need the approximate minimization to decrease fast enough. And I believe this is easy, even though the proof is a nightmare because you need from the past. And this is where RL people are good at. Uh, uh, but uh, I think this is easy because it just means that because you're warm starting, and if you're warm starting any kind of iterative algorithm, when you're warm starting it, it gets closer. Proving this is hard, but in practice, I think this is easy. So I think the really hard part is to get your surrogate function to get closer and closer and closer to your approximate surrogate function to get closer and closer to your real surrogate function. This is the hard part. The rest, I think, is feasible. All right, back to a bit of intuitions. So we have stochastic major minor, so we grab data point, compute a surrogate cost, optimize the surrogate cost. And then we have stochastic approximate major minimum. The surrogate cost is approximate, but it gets closer and closer and closer to the actual one. The minimization is partial, but the error decreases. As we have this, we can register. Okay? So basically, that's all I have. It gets pretty brutal in terms of the math. And now I have questions. So the results, if we want to take a step back, is we can optimize approximate majorities. It will still work. And we can get away with partial optimizations. It will still work. And techni technical details are those approximate majorities need to converge on expectancy to the actual ones. And uh, those partial optimization need to get better with time. So can we apply this to deep nets? I don't know at all, but I think we should try. What do we need? We need a decent majority. Ideally, it should capture some form of second order information because this will work much better. It will be robust to all conditioning. We need a fast partial optimization. And I stress the fast is if we're going to do back prop in a, in, a, in a sequential way, it won't be beneficial. We're just going to be paying this cost. But we can do things like partial back prop, parallel computing. Maybe so. Yeah, 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 that's one example. Yeah. Now, now we can just apply whatever. That's one example, but maybe we can 
think about crazier stuff. I think we should be we should be thinking about crazy stuff because if we find crazy approximations, we'll gain speed. That that's the whole point. I mean, the whole point is if we find crazy approximations that are very fast, we'll go faster. Yeah. So, so maybe there's something apply this. That's a danger. So totally, that's a danger. So the question is, if we go to the nitty gritty detail, uh, I mean, I'm afraid we might need to propagate too much information because so what we need to do is to propagate less information. But there has been a bunch of results, including by uh, Eugene Belovsky, who showed that only partial optimizing networks work well, and I, I, I suspect it's related to this. But the question is, the real question is, how do you do this without paying the cost? Right. Are there ways of doing this as parallel computing? So your, my intuition, but this isn't, I haven't you know, thought about this deeply, sure. but my intuition is you no longer need a lot of synchronization. Gates or just in your activity? In the activity across the networks, I believe. Yeah. That's the interesting thing. Update, you have to propagate this information. Yeah. And rate updates are exactly optimizing that surrogate. That's exactly it. Each layer has its own surrogate. Sure, I get that. Yeah. But to calculate those but surrogates, you, had, you need yes, to back propagate. And so yeah. I, I think the, yeah, so I think the yeah. key point, and this is what Gail is getting at, intuition is that you can, as you say, butcherize your cross function with these methods. So hopefully you can get away with fact propagating less information. Yeah, that's the and idea. I think, you know, this comes back to the key question for biological well, which um, we phrased in, in our uh, Blair's workshop as effectively the question is how high rank estimate your loss information at each layer be? And the answer, so by the way, this I'm done. This is question time or discussion time. And the answer is, you can go pretty wild as long as on a stationary distribution, we'll assume things are stationary, you, you converge to an unbiased estimate with the variance that goes to zero. But the individual steps can be wild. Yeah, I want to, I guess the question would be though, I want to see how far you can. My intuition would be that you would still need a fair bit of directional information Every direction is doing a decent job. So, <laughs> so not propagating the error at all is forgetting the sample partially. as far as, but yeah, I think you can partially propagate it. That's yeah, right. that's the problem. Exactly. They both sit there. Yeah. Yes. Because so the most obvious way okay. of of, okay. Uh, of implementing this would be to for this step, the step of partial optimization, would okay. be to do to do gradient descent on this, and then yes. we right. not gained anything. Error to your previous layers, you just use them randomly or whatever. But like, then we have to have deep architecture. We don't have deep architecture in the brain anyway, we have conscious connections. So you can play with architecture. Oh, wow, yeah, I've got some thoughts about that comment. But seriously, well, add skip connections, you'll get a fast way.
So uh, yeah, I think so we're. I would agree with the arena is that on a specific architecture, you can probably say much more than in general. So if you have ResNet, then ResNet, maybe yes, this can be used for ResNet because right. there's a specific architecture and you can start playing with it. You can actually, well, we're like a base net. You need to have some. So forward and backward, and you should add. That's kind of our common issue. But these connections don't have this issue of strength. So another, another point, yes, it's useful to see the network as exactly this, a network, information yeah. diffusing in it. If you start dropping information, it will still work. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, another, an, another way forward would just be to be quite brutally empirical and start doing things that we find convenient in our updates and see if it still works. It won't fully work because for to, to work fully, we need this violence reduction. But you know we can come back to it, right? But what you might, what might be interesting, and it's going to be a specific, it's going to be different on each architecture. Is it yeah. might be useful to update only part of this hierarchy, right. which is what we're doing. Right. And if you have enough redundancy, then you'll benefit. So if you've got a huge net with a huge amount of, of redundancy and you update only parts of it, this was our situation. Uh, then you benefit, but I think you need this. You need some form of redundancy and some form of the fact that computing only part of it is much cheaper in terms of compute power than computing the full thing. Right. Or, or you know, you need completely new different IDs based on, based on MM rather than gradient descent. Oh, that's kind of